Thank you for joining us today for the Airlift Tanker Association's virtual seminar series, Round 11. If you're not a member of the Airlift Tanker Association, please consider joining at atalink.org, become a member. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not reflect the official policy or position of the U.S. Air Force, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Government, or the Airlift Tanker Association. Please take advantage of the question and answer feature in Teams to submit your questions anytime during the presentation. There is no need to wait until the end of the presentation portion to submit your questions. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the Chairman of the Airlift Tanker Association, General Duncan McNabb. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Airlift Tanker Association's Leadership Series, Round 11. Again, I'm General Duncan McNabb, Chairman of the Airlift Tanker Association, and today we have the pleasure to host Air Mobility Command's Spark Tank. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our commander of all the Air Mobility Command, General Jackie Van Obos. Hey, good afternoon. I'm excited to introduce the keynote speaker for this iteration of ATA's Leadership Speaker Series. He is one of our nation's most driven and successful entrepreneurs who in 2016 landed on Forbes first ever America's richest entrepreneurs under 40 list and whose company, Andrel Industries, was just valued at over $1.9 billion. Combining his competitive nature and innovative set, innovation centered mindset, he's reviving and redefining <coughs> the virtual reality industry. And his company is accelerating the application of artificial intelligence and autonomy across real-time operating picture platforms, remote threat awareness capabilities, and vertical takeoff and land small unmanned autonomous systems that are advancing intelligence and air support capabilities for our forward deployed teams. Most recently, Andrew was a key capability provider during the Air Force's second ABMS demonstration on-ramp where its AI software backbone, Lattice, assisted in the successful shoot down of a mock cruise missile. Pretty impressive. Advancing our war fighting capabilities by increasing collaboration with industry partners who are innovating at the edge is exactly how we expand our military comparative advantages over our adversaries. And innovators like Mr. Palmer Lucky are helping AMC and the Air Force do exactly that. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce Mr. Palmer Lucky. I'll start, yeah. All right, am I live? Am I supposed to start talking? All right, well, thank you for that introduction. I feel like it's too kind, but that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 28 years old and I've had a pretty good run of a few good things. Um, Sam, you wanna pass me that mouse so I can click through my slides? Yeah, let's do it. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, some of you guys might know me as the founder of Anderil Industries. Most people out in the public actually know me as the founder of a VR company called Oculus VR, uh, a company that I sold to Facebook in 2014. Um, sorry that I can't be there in person today. Obviously, coronavirus has kind of just wrecked everything, and I was really looking forward to the the full scale of what this was going to be. And sad that it ended up getting uh, that it ended up getting getting trimmed a little bit. Um, I'm most known for my work on virtual reality. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I dropped out of school to start a VR company called Oculus. Uh, I'd come up with some pretty good virtual reality technology, which is an area where I had been a hobbyist since the age of 15. I built a lot of virtual reality headsets as, as a hobby. Uh, when I decided to turn it into a company, I was kind of working from a different angle than most people who start companies. Uh, I just wanted to work on VR technology and I needed to trick investors into giving me money so that I could keep working on it and pay myself to do so. Uh, it turned out to be the right thing at the right time and uh, it, it grew pretty fast. But what not everyone knows is that prior to my work on Oculus, I worked in an army funded research lab, the ICT Mixed Reality Lab on an army program called Brave Mind. And the intent of Brave Mind was to treats veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder using virtual reality exposure therapy. So putting them into virtual environments that would spe were specifically designed to set off their PTSD symptoms so that they could, under the guidance of a therapist, learn to cope with them and manage them without prescription medication, without self-medication. Um, that was a really, really great experience. I spent about a year in that lab. I was just a hardware monkey, making the motion capture systems work, making the, uh, the computer hardware work. 
But while I was there, I learned a lot about how DOD worked and how DOD procurement worked and even a lot about how DOD research worked. Um, and I, I won't dwell on it too long, but it's important to talk about just so you guys understand where, where I'm coming from and why I ended up where I am. Uh, it was basically hugely bad all of the time, nonstop. And uh, at the time, I was only 18 years old, and so I just assumed that this was how the real world was. Everything was awful. Everything was slow. Everyone had their own crazy agendas. Nobody knew what they were doing. Uh, it turns out that there are a lot of people like that in the real world, but uh, in my experience, I've never seen it quite the way that I did when I had to work on this government program. Uh, there was one point that really stuck out to me where we were at the time using a head mounted display that cost many thousands of dollars. It uh, had been around for about a decade and it had a built in motion tracker that had only one driver and that driver only supported Windows XP 32 bit. Now, I don't know how technical you guys are, but 32 bit operating systems can only address a maximum of about four gigabytes of memory, including video memory, which was not remotely enough to do what we were doing. And on top of that, Microsoft was end of lifing support for Windows, uh, Windows, Windows XP 32 bit. So we were trying to switch over to me and some of the engineers were trying to switch over to a new head mounted display before we rolled this out from our one VA hospital prototype deployment to 40 VA hospitals across the country. And, uh, we found a head-mounted display that was much cheaper, much easier to get, much easier to get parts for. Uh, it had a motion tracker with a driver that supported modern operating systems, which at the time was Windows Vista. Uh, and the when we tried to push this through and said, hey, we, we want to switch this to a head-mounted display, we were told by the government people who are running this program, no, no, it's too late. That's not your, it's not your place as one of the engineers to think that you can just use taxpayer money however you want. And we're like, well, no, no, this is like, this is obviously, you know, not a case of us trying to misuse taxpayer money. In fact, this head-mounted display is 10 times cheaper. It's so much better that we can actually simulate the old headset on the new head-mounted display if we wanted to. They said, no, the program requirements are clear. It says that the head-mounted display will have a resolution of 800 by 600 per eye and a diagonal field of view of 42 degrees per eye. And if it isn't that exact specification and it doesn't meet every particular little thing we've written on this piece of paper, you can't use it. You have to keep using the ancient thing that is discontinued that is not going to support any modern operating systems. And we're going to use this system for the next 10 or 15 years with that technology. Um, that was really frustrating for me as a young idealistic guy who really wanted to make a difference. I knew that these processes were making a serious detrimental effect on the program and uh, that stuck with me for a long time. Even when I moved on from working in that lab, I stayed in touch with a lot of the people there. And when I was working on military technology later at Oculus, uh, I, I, I tried to tried to try to get out of that and sell as many really good, really cheap VR headsets to as many people as I could. And actually in the end, it was a happy story. In the end, the Brave Mind program actually did switch over to the Oculus Rift about three years after I started Oculus. So the, the, the ending was very happy. I felt like I had done a good job of getting out of that, going into the private sector and innovating in a way that in the end helped even the program I was working on a lot more than I ever could have working inside of the machine. Uh, so Oculus brought a lot of attention to virtual reality. Uh, I ended up on the cover of a bunch of magazines for, for because they thought that I, whoops. Uh, I ended up on the cover of a bunch of magazines. Uh, we were acquired by Facebook in early 2014 for $3 billion. That was a really wild journey. Uh, I had started Oculus just alone in my trailer. I grew that to about 40 people when we were acquired. And then over the next five years, grew that into a team of about 1,400 people working on, uh, on Oculus and our flagship product, the Oculus Rift. Um, now, one of the things that really bothered me when we were acquired by Facebook that I had not predicted was going to happen, <clears throat> not predicted was going to happen, is that we were forced to stop all of our contracts that we had with the Department of Defense and with all the branches of the US military. And this was justified in a few ways to me. One was that everyone was doing it. It turns out this was just par for the course. Uh, one of my friends has an augmented reality company that was acquired by Apple. They immediately killed all of his defense work, said he couldn't work with DoD anymore. Uh, Boston Dynamics, a leading robotics company, was purchased by Google and had all of their defense contracts immediately killed. And then a couple years later, they got sold, spun back out into a private company again. Now DoD doesn't want to work with them because they know that they'll just kick them to the curb the, the second they can get away with it. Um, and then you have companies like Google, which at the time, this wasn't really known, but later you know, they, they, they pulled out of Project Maven. 
uh, said we're not going to do any more work with, with, with the DOD on the vast majority of the work that they do. And this was something that I was told at Facebook. And this was justified in a few ways. One was, oh, well, the, the press is really mean and they'll write mean things about us if we work with the military. To, oh, well, some of our employees are upset about it. And so we don't want to upset any employees. We got to make sure that we don't uh, upset anybody. Uh, and this is, I wasn't going to tell this story, but I'll tell the very short version. One time I, so I drive a 1985 Humvee and I drove it to work one day and then they called the cops on me and told me that I had brought a weapon on campus that was in a, a symbol of American imperialism and genocide and that I was never allowed to bring it to work again. Uh, this, so like that, that, that's how, how nutty some of the people in these organizations are. Uh, not aligned at all with, I think, most of America, certainly not most of our service members. But then the real reason that they did not want to work on any duty problems was being compromised by the financial aspects of China being a superpower. The thing that a lot of people don't consider is that America's most valuable technology companies are in one of two camps. Some of them are already deeply working with the Chinese. They make huge amounts of money off the Chinese. And if they were ever to get locked out of the Chinese market, which the Chinese government is happy to do, they will do it at the, you know, at the, they'll, they'll do it at the drop of a hat. Uh, if they ever get kicked out, they could potentially lose dozens or hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap overnight. Then there's the other category, which are companies that are not in China, but someday they probably will be. Facebook is in this category. They're not allowed in China right now, but Mark Zuckerberg spends a lot of time in China. He learned Mandarin Chinese for a year. He offered the leader of China the chance to name his newborn daughter. Uh, he's, he's really, really pushing on the Chinese to, to, let them into, to, to, to let them into China. And the side effect of this is that the United States financial markets uh, believe that in the future, Facebook is going to be making lots of money off China, and then that's factored into their stock price. That is, their stock price today reflects the hypothetical reality of them making billions of dollars from China in the future. So if anything would ever happen that would cause China to say, hey, Facebook is never, ever, ever coming to our country, then they would lose hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap and working with the United States military in their estimation is the type of thing that, especially in case of some kind of geopolitical conflict, could lead to them being locked out of China and losing a lot of market cap. Uh, now, I, I can't totally fault them. I, I, I didn't understand this reasoning until I became an executive at Facebook and kind of had the riot act read to me a few times. I wasn't allowed to trans, translate my product into Chinese because they thought that it would uh, look like we were trying to get around the Chinese censors. And uh, one, one time I said, well, why can't we just say that the Chinese translation of my product is for uh, Taiwanese users? They speak Chinese. They said, oh, no, if you even say the word Taiwan, we are never going to get into China. You don't even ever say the word Taiwan. And that was something that really concerned me because it made me realize that for the first time in United States history, the most innovative technology companies in the United States, the most powerful technology companies in the United States with a monopoly on the best technical talent in many areas, and also with a lot of technology that was given to them by the federal government, we're going to refuse to do work with the DOD, violating an implicit agreement that has gone back you know, a century. And in, in many ways, to me, it feels like, uh, you know, imagine if General Electric or Westinghouse or Boeing had said during World War II, well, you know, we really like America, but we think that Imperial Japan is gonna be a really big market. So I'm not sure we can really help you make anything. Uh, that is the unfortunate situation that we are that we are in today. And that Humvee story I told you is one of like a dozen stories that I that I have. Uh, I guess the other very short story is there are no American flags flying anywhere on the Facebook campus. Only one of them on the Google campus, and I, I bet it's come down by now. We'll see. I'm going to keep rolling because I could just talk about this issue all day. Um, I, in in 2017, I was terminated by Mark Zuckerberg. We didn't get along super well, uh, but luckily I had something in mind for what I wanted to do next. Uh, I decided that I wanted to kind of try to solve this trend that I saw where the best people were getting locked up inside of tech companies that refused to work on the DoD. I wanted to build not a new defense contracting company, but a new defense product company that could use its own money to decide what to build, how to build it, when it's done, and then sell it to the United States military. This is not only the way that I think that the U.S. military should work, but in many ways, it is the way that the Chinese uh, defense apparatus, and even to some degree, the Russian defense apparatus, which you would generally think of as you know more socialist, uh, they're actually very, very good at integrating commercial technologies into their military sector very, very quickly. And they see this as a path to leapfrogging over the United States. They see what a terrible job we are doing in adopting virtual, or sorry, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. 
and they know that this is a way where they might be able to achieve an asymmetric advantage without investing a, as much money as we are. Uh, Russia and China know that they're not going to just build a bigger, better Navy than us anytime soon. They know they're not going to build a bigger, better Air Force anytime soon, but they definitely can beat us on artificial intelligence if they just get some of these asymmetric gains. Uh, there's a really good quote from Vladimir Putin a few years ago when he was talking to college students, trying to get them to work on artificial intelligence. And he said, the country that becomes the leader in artificial intelligence will become the ruler of the entire world, uh, which I really love that quote because it's like a very Bond villain type of thing to say. Usually you don't get world leaders in the modern you know, 2000s onward saying, ah, yes, we are going to become the ruler of the entire world. Uh, I kind of appreciate that about him. He's a he's a he's in this one way, at least honest about his intentions. Uh, but he's not just saying it because he wants to sound really cool and like a Bond villain. He's saying it because he does actually believe that this is a way that they're going to be able to surpass the United States. Uh, that's why my company decided to focus on these core technologies. When I started Oculus, I was working on the Oculus Rift, this virtual reality headset. And like I told you earlier, I was not really thinking about business when I started the company. I wanted to find people who would give me money so I could keep working on the thing that I liked working on. I also believe that virtual reality was the future of humanity and that eventually we're going to spend more time in virtual worlds than the real world. And that even the real world itself will become an augmented reality and a blend of the digital and the real. And I know that makes me sound like a nutter, but I have to put my stake in the ground and say that is still what I believe. Uh, Anderil was a little different. When I started the company, I actually did not know what we were going to build. I did not know what products we were going to build. I had this overarching objective, which was build the things that are going to keep America safe against more technologically advanced allies, and then separately save taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars a year while making tens of billions of dollars a year. Uh, the things that I decided to work on, which are on this slide, bore out of a first principles analysis of what I thought the DoD was doing a really bad job at, what our major defense primes like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and Boeing are doing a bad job at, and then as a third requirement, things that I didn't feel like they were going to do better on. There's some things that DoD is really bad at today that I feel like they're getting better at. I don't want to work on those things. They, 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 they should just get better at it on their own. They should work with the major primes. They should solve those problems. Uh, when I was building this company, another big difference from the way that I worked at Oculus is at Oculus, we would spend years working on a single product, trying to get it into a state where we could ship to millions of people, where we could make a bunch of money and convince millions of people that our product was worth buying and that it had no problems, that it was super slick and always perfect. In our case, working with our customers in the US government, we've done something very differently. We've tried to build things where we can get out the minimum viable capability to our customers very, very fast. If our team can build software that is helpful to US SOCOM in two weeks, we are going to do that. If we can build something that is useful to the Air Force in a few months, like we did with this ABMS thing, the Advanced Battle Management System, where we integrated dozens of military assets from uh, fighter jets to uh, self-propelled howitzers to naval destroyers, all into one virtual reality command and control interface. You know, we, we were able to do that in a matter of months. And the reason that we're able to justify doing that is because we're a product company. We build things using our own money and then we sell them to the government. This is very different from the model that most defense primes have where they get paid based on time and materials and then a fixed percentage of profit on top. That model cripples innovative thinking and it cripples incentives for innovation because the slower you are, the more money you make. The more times you remake the same system rather than reusing old technology, the more money you make. The more custom bespoke components that you make, the more money that you make rather than stick with off-the-shelf systems. It's just, this was something that I saw for the first time when I worked at that VR lab that was, that was funded by the Army. You know, even our own lab, we would stretch out research projects because we knew that the program was never going to get canceled and that it was more important to keep everything going and keep the money flowing than to necessarily wrap things up as quickly as possible. Um, when I was first starting the company, I will admit that this strategy was very, very, uh, it was met very, very skeptically. Uh, I met with a lot of customers. I, I, I won't name which customer it was, uh, just because I don't want to I don't want to poke them in the eye too much. But we met with one government customer, a federal government customer, and I told them what I had decided to build. I said we are going to build Lattice, an artificial intelligence platform that will fuse all of your assets into a single common operating picture that allows all of your machines and all of your people to know exactly what's going on, where all the people, where all the vehicles, where all the enemies and all the friends are, and allows you to push commands to all these systems in real time with no delays, and also to predict what's going to happen in the near future based on past events. And the response I got was, you're crazy, this isn't going to work, this is never going to work, 
we are not going to give you any money at all to work on this. And at the end of the meeting, I said, well, just to be clear, if I build it, if we do make something that works, would you buy it? And the answer was, yeah, of course, if you built this, we'd buy this. You're pitching a science fiction dream that nobody's ever been able to pull off. And of course, we would buy it if you actually had it. To be clear, we don't. it's not that we don't believe in the idea in the long run. We just don't believe in you or your team or your abilities as a video game computer boy to come in and make any difference in our industry. Um, and I took that as a challenge. I understood where they were coming from. No matter what I do, I'm always just going to be the computer boy wearing the glasses, typing on the computer. I'm never going to be someone who really understands what it's like to be on the front lines working on these missions. But you know, I, I did my best to I did my best to support them anyway, despite the the lack of faith. And to be fair, two months later, we gave this exact same customer a demo out in the Mojave Desert of our system working end to end with our own sensors that we had put together. Uh, and then four months after that, they had us on a pilot contract. Uh, four months after that, they had us on a real contract. And then 24 months later, we were on a multi-hundred million dollar program of record, making serious, make, you know, making serious revenue and deploying hundreds of these systems out into real combat environments. So, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the nice thing about the DoD is when you actually can prove that you're not a con artist, you, they do tend to move a lot faster. Um, I, I probably did seem crazy right off the bat, though. I, like, I did have nothing. I only had me and seven people and a uh, presentation and no technology at all. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of customers where, we, where we've gone through and sold the same thing to a lot of these guys. It's really nice to be able to reuse a lot of the technology because that allows us to focus our efforts on the things that actually are new and are innovative rather than rebuilding the core every single time. And the nice thing about that is that every customer that we've ever sold to has ended up buying more things that integrate into the same platform. We've never had a customer buy things and then you know just stick with that. They always want to add more. They always want to add more capability, more sensors. And when you build AI platforms that allow you to integrate more and more sensors without increasing your manpower requirements, it lets you put together con ops that are just so much cooler than anything you can do when you're limited by what you're limited by the number of people that you can afford to have sitting in a trailer staring at screens. Um, so one of the questions that I got when I was doing this, and I, you know, again, I wish I'd done this in person because it's always fun to talk with people about what their projects are. And uh, you know, I, was, I was asked, how can, you know, how can people innovate? How can you help inspire our airmen to innovate? And it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty tough to say, especially because innovation is just so different in every possible area that you could apply it to. And it's also a little bit of a you know, self-defeating question. You know, defini definitionally, there can't be a catch-all answer. Uh, because otherwise everyone would be doing it and innovation would be happening all the time everywhere and we wouldn't even need the word innovation. Uh, so you know, I can give trite answers like you know, follow your passions, but something that, I, that I've learned over the years is that that's actually the worst way to innovate. I got very, very lucky with Oculus. I was working on something that I liked and that happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, but that is usually a pretty bad way to start a business. People who say, hey, just follow your passion, work on what you really like doing, it's not likely to work out because most of the things that you like doing are not necessarily the area where you can have the biggest impact. Uh, they're not necessarily the area where you are going to be able to make the biggest change. Like in this case, look at Anderol. I definitely am – look, this is going to sound, sound disrespectful but not being disrespectful – I could have had a lot more fun working on almost anything than slogging through the DOD procurement process and selling technology to our troops. I'm not doing it because I'm passionate about that process. And I'm not doing it because you know, I'm a passionate technologist. I work liking on, like working on technology. But when you start a tech company, you don't get to work on tech for very long. Very quickly, you end up doing a bunch of other sloggy stuff that nobody wants to do with the exception of like MBA graduates. And you know that's that's not my passion but it is what I need to do to actually make an impact. So the first thing I do is if you're gonna try to innovate, find out where you think you can make the biggest impact based on your skill set, based on the things that you are good at. And if you happen to be passionate about it, that's great. But uh, contrary to what you've may heard from every children's movie, don't follow your passions as the guiding principle if you wanna make a difference because very rarely is it necessarily going to work. Um, also, I could have just worked on AR or VR for the military, but after analyzing things, it appeared that that was not an area where the DOD was doing a particularly bad job. There was no reason for me to spend my time doing it. Um, we, I also want to distinguish between a few different types of innovation. Uh, there's always room to innovate within the scope of your own life, you know, like questioning the way you do things, uh, making your own habits more conductive to the efficiency and success of your own personal life. Uh, and that's, that, that's one type of valid type of innovation. Uh, but you know, the other type of innovation is 
uh, you know, how do you actually innovate at scale? And that's the type that interests me. It's about how you can not just change yourself, but how you can change people around you, how can you change processes around you, how you can change companies around you. And this is really, really hard. Uh, I think the first thing you need to do is come up with a concrete vision of the future that is going to convince not only you, but also the people that are around you. There's very few things that one person can do on their own. Uh, an analogy that I like to use is gravity losses in a rocket system. Um, so let's say that you want to have a rocket that goes into space or you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you're trying to get into orbit. It takes a certain amount of thrust just to hold that rocket a foot off of the pad, you know, just barely up in the air. And if you add a little bit of thrust on top of that, uh, you are going to move pretty slow. You're going to very slowly rise to the air. That's a case where most of your thrust is going to gravity losses. I think that a lot of projects that you can work on in innovation against a system is, is a very similar type of uh, situation where the first chunk of effort that you put in and the first part of continuing effort you put in is not actually accelerating you. It's not actually getting you to where you need to be. It's just fighting the gravity losses of working through the system, convincing other people, doing things that you have to do, filing weekly reports. If you're starting a business, you know, figuring out payroll, figuring out HR, figuring out the legal aspects, figuring out the sales aspects. These are all the gravity losses that you have. To, and when you're building building a company and trying to innovate, you can't just build enough to overcome gravity losses and a little extra. You need to overcome gravity losses and then add a lot of thrust on top of that. The only way you're going to be able to do that is by working with other people. The odds of you being able to do something totally on your own are very low. That's why most one-man startups end up just stuck in the gravity losses period. They can never have enough thrust and kind of enough push and enough convincing to actually achieve escape velocity. And they end up just stuck on the ground forever. Uh, this is especially important when you're trying to figure out how to do things in a new way, when you're already expected to also perform well within the existing systems and to do things the old way. Um, you know, th this is not, 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 to, not, not to be disrespectful again, but in the Department of Defense, I've seen that there is a lot there are a lot of people who want to do new things and they're trapped inside of the old system and they feel like they can't simultaneously do the thing that they've been doing all along and also be expected to do things in a new way using even more time out of the little time that they have. So the best way to get around that is to find other people who either share your vision or uh, convince them to share your vision. This is actually probably one of my very few true superpowers. I'm not the best engineer in the world. I'm not the best businessman in the world, but I'm pretty good at convincing other engineers that my particular vision of the world is the correct one and the one they should be working on. If I didn't have that skill, I wouldn't be able to attract people to help me overcome gravity loss and accelerate. Um, now, at the same time, uh, you know, this is something I was specifically asked to asked to talk about: is how can air, how, you know, how how can airmen work on innovation when they have so many other things to do, when they have so many other duties? And uh, you know, on the one hand, I'm saying go out and get other people, but don't try to do too many people. Uh, it turns out that two people each working eight hours a week in their spare time on something is going to be a lot more effective than 20 people putting in a combined eight hours a week of their own time. Uh, the more people that you try to split that effort among, the harder it is to have that single cohesive vision and message and productivity that actually goes anywhere. So, you know, contradicting what I just said, find other people who either believe in your vision already, they understand the problem the way that you do, they understand the way that you want to solve it, or go find people who don't agree with you and beat on them and convince them that that is the way things are and that you guys can work together to do something different. Um, I'm also going to say I'm just really disappointed the competition didn't happen. I was really looking forward to judging the competition. I was really looking forward to seeing that go forward. I don't know all of the background behind between you know, behind how it ended up being the way that it is. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to put down anybody who did it. I'm sure there's very good reasons. I'm sure that you guys know more about it than me. Um, but I, I, I will say that, how would I put this? In the DOD, there's a lot of what I call innovation theater. Um, and I borrowed, I, I adapted this term from the term security theater, which many of you are probably familiar with. You know, if you're going through the TSA at an airport and they're trying to pat you down and look for uh, contraband or bombs or whatever, 
I think that a lot of us have thought about ways we might be able to get bombs through TSA, knives through TSA, guns through TSA, just for fun, right? You know, we're just thinking, boy, yeah, you know, does this really work? Is this really effective? And the answer is no, not really. It's not going to stop, stop anybody but the dumbest people. It's kind of security theater. It's the performative act of doing it where the value actually is. And I feel like a lot of what goes on in the DOD is a little bit of what I call innovation theater, which is where people in the DoD understand the importance of innovation. They want to encourage more of it. They want to encourage uh, you know, airmen and infantrymen to contribute. They want to work with smaller companies. They want to work with mom and pop shops. They really want to uplift them. And the motivations are very pure and the efforts are very sincere, but they end up working on the wrong things and measuring the wrong things in many cases. Uh, there's a particular there's a particular program there's a particular a particular program on the Air Force side where they were talking about ah oh, we 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 got all these pitches we, we we got pitched in a few minutes and we wrote a check to every single company that came in to pitch us and this is the type of thing where if, if a if a venture capitalist did this in the private sector I, they would kind of be laughed out of the room like imagine if I was a, a private investor. And people were asking me, so you know, how, what's your investment philosophy? I said, oh, my investment philosophy is to invest a little bit of money into lots and lots of small things, and uh, you know, with very little regard for actually turning them into real programs. I said, oh, well, how many of these companies have succeeded? Imagine if my answer was none of them. None of them have ever turned into a program of record. None of them have ever actually been deployed at scale downrange. And uh, by the and they said, oh, well, how much money did you give them? I said, oh. Uh, so little that they could never have possibly achieved any of the things that we said that we wanted them to achieve. Like that, that's a really tough situation. And when you're looking at smart people, whether they're in duty or outside of duty, they look at these things happening and they say, wait a sec, where are the examples of this innovation theater leading to anything? Where are the examples of this actually going anywhere? And smart people, the most innovative people, pick up on the fact that so often it doesn't go anywhere. And it's really discouraging. Like the most discouraging thing to people is when they was when they're told, "Hey, you know, be innovative, do something new, go out and accomplish something incredible on you know that, that, that nobody's ever done before." And you say, "Well, wait, where are the examples of other people doing this?" And they say, "Oh, well, here's this example from this guy in the Korean War. Here's an example from a guy in World War II, and here's like one guy during the entire global war on terror who pulled it off." Uh, it's 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 not it's not nearly as inspiring as it could be, particularly when you look at the private sector, where there are dozens of you know multi billion dollar companies made every decade in gaming, in fast casual dining, in automotive, in biotech, and financial technology. Uh, it turns out that the area of national security is a really hard area to achieve large scale success in, and the only there's only three multi billion dollar companies in the entire defense space in the last 30 years it's palantir spacex and my company Anduril. and all three of those companies were founded by people who had sold their previous company for billions of dollars which is not a scalable model and not a piece of advice i can give to people like i can't go to people and say well if you really want to innovate inside of dod inside of your unit i encourage you to make billions of dollars and then come back and do it uh yeah, so I, I, I'm not trying to end on a negative note, but I think the, the, the positive interpretation of this is when you're thinking about how you're going to innovate and when you're talking about with the people that you're going to work with, when you're talking with the people who are above you, when you're talking to your boss and your boss's boss, reinforce the importance of measuring the right metrics for success. That includes speed, that includes creativity, that includes cutting costs, but it also includes the scale and the impact that something can actually have. And if you can convince people to measure that type of success as their metric for success, you have a way better chance of them making sure that it actually gets pushed through the early stage where you get a press release and a really fun photo op all the way to something that is actually out in the field used at massive scale. And those are the programs that I think when I have seen them in DOD, they don't get nearly enough attention. I'd love to see a lot more highlighting of the handful of people who have pushed things through, even what people could call boring things, uh, rather than the things that are just really shiny, you know, DARPA style projects that, that, that never get never get traction from leadership. Uh, so hopefully I haven't upset anybody too much, but I, I, I did just have to did just have to go into it. And I, I felt a little bit like this in this case. I was like, man, this is so cool. I love how they're going to do this competition. They're going to have all of this judging. And in the end, it was like, oh, we're, we're actually not going to be able to do the judging and we're just going to distribute the money. Um, I was like, oh, man, it, I know that if I were a team that had put together a pitch, I probably wouldn't feel super stoked about that. And I wouldn't feel stoked certainly the next time that I'm asked to do it. So you know, ho hopefully things can continue to improve and hopefully everyone can be looking at the right, right metrics. Um, how are we doing on time, Sam? I think we should wrap up early.
I'm not going to talk about this. We need to go to Q&A because I actually want to make sure that we have time to do Q&A because I can ramble about things that I want to talk about all day long. I'll never stop, uh, but it's way more fun to talk about the things that people want to talk about themselves. All righty, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here's one of our questions um, uh, from an anonymous. Uh, in your opening, you spoke about uh, leading edge text divorce from the DOD. I thought back about to the book The Kill Chain by Christian Bros. How does the DOD come back together with the Technological Center? So this is really tough. I think that it is not going to happen unless it makes financial sense for these companies. I don't see another mechanism by which we can make them want to work with DOD because the reality is like these decisions, what people think that it's an ideological battle. They think that the executives hate the military or that the employees hate the military. That's actually not really the case. In my experience, you kind of have nine out of 10 Silicon Valley workers supporting DOD, and it's the one out of 10 who's just really angry and vocal about it that gets used as an excuse by the executives. Like when I was at Facebook, we could never go out and say, when people would say, hey, why don't you do more work with the you know, intelligence community? Why don't you do more work with DOD? Nobody could ever go out and say, because we want to get the big China megabucks. They had to say, oh, well, you know, we our employees have concerns about that, blah, 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 blah. It, those radical employees are basically an excuse for executives to not talk about the truth, which is they're trying to make as much money as possible. They're trying to keep their company going and making as much money as possible. And unfortunately, they don't really care about the United States as a strategic entity versus all these other countries, versus all these other countries. Um, so the way to change that, I think, is to change the financial calculus. Now, I have a few ideas on how to do this. Some of them are crazier, some of them are less crazy. I'll be honest, politically, I lean libertarian, so I'm not a fan of the kind of government comes in and mandates that people do things. I think we shouldn't do what China does, which is force every private company to hand over all their technology to the US DOD, whether they want to or not. One thing that I think we could do, one lever that I think we can pull, is to look at how a lot of this technology actually makes it into the private sector. I mentioned this a little earlier, but for decades, there's been an implicit understanding. DARPA, NASA, uh, the, the RCO, all of these, you know, the Department of Energy, they do these huge numbers or huge amount of federal research. Some of it defense focused, some of it not. And then they hand it to America's technologically savvy companies and say, hey, you can use this, you can commercialize this, we're going to publish all this information. This is done on the taxpayer dime because we want it to lead to a return for our country. For decades, there was an implicit understanding that the companies that got this research and the companies that got this technology would contribute by, in turn, working towards our national security. And we never had a contract that really said that's how it had to work. It was just kind of understood. I think that in a world where the most innovative companies in America are violating this implicit agreement, take, like you have Facebook, Google, Apple getting huge amounts of technology transfer from NASA, from Department of Energy, from DARPA, from all the research they do, and then basing their own products on that research, hiring a lot of the best researchers out of those programs to put them in the private sector. And then they just trap it inside of the private sector. Like Boston Dynamics and their robotics program was a great example of this. Google basically let DARPA pay for a foundation of robotics understanding that they then took and said, oh, DOD doesn't get any of this. It's ours now. I think that as a country, we need to revisit that and say, you know what? Maybe if you don't want to work with DOD, maybe you don't get the access to use all those things. Maybe we shouldn't allow companies to purchase defense companies that were funded by taxpayers and DOD dollars if they're going to take that and turn it into a pure profit motive with no strategic defense motive. I don't know the best way to do that, but I do know that it's kind of crazy that we have the government spending billions of dollars on programs that then get purchased by big tech companies that then deprive the DOD of all the fruits. All right, sir, get uh, time for uh, one last question. Uh, you mentioned AI and ML. So scanning the horizon, what other new technologies do you we need to pursue for the 2035 fight or further into the future against a peer competitor? Oh man, there's a lot of things. I'm very excited about vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, particularly at the smaller end of the scale. Fundamentally, I think that the existence of machine learning and AI will change the way that we think about what airframes we're going to build, not just in terms of their capabilities. Like the example everyone already always loves is if you've probably heard this before, so it's going to sound trite, and I, I, I want to make be clear like how stereotypical this is. 
People are like, AI is going to revolutionize fighter jets. Why? Because they'll be able to pull harder Gs. They'll be able to do maneuvers that no human aircraft could do. And like, that is true. That is pretty cool. But most combat is not going to be, you know, fighter on fighter dogfights that come down to who can pull more Gs. It's going to come down to scale. It's going to come down to quantity. It's going to come down to economic advantage. And that's actually where I'm most excited. I'm most excited about a world where we're able to choose to make different airframes because they're powered by autonomy. We can say, you know what? Before, we never could have fielded a force of 200,000 US Air Force pilots. But if we have an autonomous pilot in the airframe, we can field a force of 200,000 unmanned airframes. And now you say, oh, but it's too expensive. We can never make them, you know, we can never make them cheap enough. But because there's a computer in the cockpit rather than a person, you don't necessarily need to x-ray every single bolt and make sure that it's able to do a million flight hours without cracking. You don't have to make sure that the plane never, ever, ever, ever crashes. You can say, you know what, I'm gonna build a plane, it's pretty good, and it crashes every you know, 100,000 hours of operation or 10,000 hours of operation. We're not gonna use most of them most of the time, and if I care about reliability, I'm just gonna multiply the number of airframes I deploy rather than multiplying the complexity, cost, weight, and compromising the performance of the single airframe that I'm building for a person. Uh, I really like people. I'm not in the camp that thinks that AI is going to replace people. I think that people are too good at what we do, but we need to do what we do, which is high level decision making, high level analysis, managing, you know, managing things at a higher level than the at the metal management of how the machinery is functioning and what it's doing. I think machines are going to get way better at doing that. They're going to get way better at, uh, you're going to just get way better at that. Can we do one more question? I prefer we, I know that uh, the general would like to get on uh, with her thing, but I would like We're to thank you for a very, thank you so much. <laughs> a very energetic presentation. And now back to General Van Ovost. Okay, great job. Thank you, Mr. Lucky. You know, curious, competitive, and innovative airmen team with industry partners equally committed to pushing the envelope and changing the game altogether, overcoming gravity, as you said. And that's how we're going to expand our comparative advantage across the entire competition continuum. Now, Chief BK and I are just past the halfway point on our 100-day listening tour. When we started in August, we specifically dedicated time to get to the wings, to meet our airmen, and really hear their concerns and their aspirations. I have to tell you, mobility warriors in this command are empowered, they're energetic, dedicated to the mission, and passionate about how they serve. We've had a chance to hear a lot of different perspectives on what we need to continue to stop or change. But the one constant idea prevalent at all the stops so far has been about innovation. Our airmen are excited about innovation because it gives them a chance to make a difference, to apply their great ideas to solve complex problems, enhance our warfighting capabilities, and get after readiness for the high-end fight. I couldn't be prouder to lead the incredible airmen of this command and I'm excited to highlight the final four Spark Tank submissions and announce the winning pitch that will continue on and compete at the Air Force level. But first, I want to thank all the incredible airmen that submitted their ideas to the competition. There were 49 pitches, but behind that, we know that there were a passionate and dedicated team behind each one of them. From the airmen who first thought of the idea to the leadership team that empowered and supported their concept, each pitch was remarkable and demonstrated how each of you are owning your spheres of influence and taking action to make the mission better. You know, team, normally, uh, as like you said, uh, it'd be at this point that we would review each of the final four pitches and announce one winner. That would be proceeding forward to compete at the Air Force level and then simply thank the rest of the teams for, the, uh, for their ideas and their work. But this year, we're changing the game. We're flipping the script. Innovation is one of this command's foundational principles, and it's essential to each one of our priorities. If we're going to accelerate change, if we're going to compete against our adversaries with an infinite mindset, if we're going to build, train, develop, and sharpen the force to win the high-end fight, we have to identify where we can implement lasting change and just get after it. We can't expect different results if we keep doing things the same way. If this year, 2020, has taught us anything, it's it's taught us that we have to reevaluate the things we do and why we do them. That's why after reviewing the final four, I told my team, I don't need to see any more. We're gonna get after all of them. We're gonna implement all four ideas and many more as we speak. 
As the chief of staff, Joe Brown stated, we have to accelerate change or risk losing to our aggressive global competitors. When it came to the formalities of the Phoenix Spark Tank, I saw an opportunity to do just that. Here's the plan of action moving forward. AMC will be sending one pitch forward to compete at the Air Force level. The idea that has the greatest potential to make an impact across the Air Force. But before I announce which one that one is, I want to provide an update on the other three that I've already tasked and we're already getting after. For each of the following spark tank pitches, I have identified one of my directors as a champion that will flight follow the idea until it successfully crosses the finish line. The first spark tank pitch I have already initiated is on remote training in a travel restricted environment. That comes from Tech Sergeant Luis Gomez, Staff Sergeant Daniel Rose, and Mr. Augustine Cercillo from the 423rd Mobility Training Squadron at Joint, Vic, uh, Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst. As COVID challenged many of the things we took for granted, attending in residence training was one of them. Recognizing the need to increase the agility and flexibility with which their unit provides training to airmen across the Air Force, these mobility airmen are creating online versions of any in residence course offered to ensure that they can meet their mission despite major travel restrictions. These online versions will combine video conferencing, interactive 360 degree photos and videos, and a learning management system to deliver highly effective, immersive distance learning experiences. My A6 is already working with the submitters to solve a few issues to ensure the initiative is aligned with the policies from the Secretary of the Air Force's CIO office. But this is a game changer on how the Air Force's Expeditionary Operations School provides world-class training for our people. And another example of how we're just getting after it. The next Spark Tank, uh, Spark Tank pitch the staff is already making headway on is the Maintenance Supply Kiosk pitch developed by Senior Airman Alicia Carter from the 317th Maintenance Squadron at Dias Air Force Base. Senior Airman Carter recognized the inefficiencies and chance for human error with the current supply receiving and returning systems within the aircraft maintenance units. Her pitch is to create a maintenance supply kiosk that, using integrated technologies, significantly increases the efficiency and accuracy of those supply transactions. Just a few of the many capabilities this kiosk would enable are creating a digital paper trail for maintenance and supply airmen, the ability to automatically input transaction information to existing databases, and the ability to print labels with scannable codes that eliminates the need for manual input into the spreadsheets. Think unattended stack bar with payment kiosks, but instead of monsters and chips, these are aircraft parts. This was a no brainer. We can no longer afford for our airmen to waste time hand jamming information into paper spreadsheets in today's digital environment. After review, headquarters AMC A4 will be working closely with senior Airman Carter to build this capability within the current GO81 system. Dias Air Force Base has been selected as the test bed location for this new capability with senior Airman Carter leading the way. The final spark tank pitch that we're immediately implementing is the passenger terminal rapid check-in pitch that comes from Master Sergeant Joseph Lathwood from the 735th Air Mobility Squadron and Staff Sergeant Santosh Defkota from the 69th Aerial Port Squadron. Their pitch is a new rapid check-in process that uses scanner and Microsoft Access to instantly pull passenger data from their cat card and automatically publish it to boarding passes, manifests, baggage tag, tags, and weapons reports. Their idea was born from the frustration of having to manually process over 15,000 passengers by hand during 16 days of gates outages. This new rapid check-in capability automates this process significantly decreases the possibility of processing errors and creates a post-processing file that can be uploaded into gates when the system comes back online. Headquarters AMC A4 is implementing this pitch right now and we'll work closely with Staff Sergeant Devkota and the Air Force Research Laboratory to incorporate his initiative 
into a long-term objective to implement the rapid aggregation for manifesting automation application. That means the spark tank pitch that will be moving forward to compete at the Air Force level is the Digital Air Crew Initiative Framework for Solving Digital Problems pitch developed by Mr. Ward Walker, Headquarters AMC A6. Captain Christopher Pegulo, 317th Operation Support Squadron. Major Justin Poole, 21st Airlift Squadron. Major Joe, or Major John Cockburn, Commander's Action Group, Air Force Expeditionary Center. And Major Stephen Heptig, 305th Air Mobility Wing. Their pitch is to implement a command-wide initiative to leverage available capabilities within the Def Department of Defense technology stacks, such as Mattermost and Puckboard to advance our secure global command and control capabilities over resilient distributed networks not located behind a CAC firewall. As mobility airmen, we execute missions around the globe, oftentimes separated from physical command and control nodes. It's imperative that we advance our ability to transmit and receive critical mission information at the speed of relevance to provide our airmen the agility and flexibility to make the mission essential essential and successful. The 60th and 305th Air Mobility Wings have been flex testing and experimenting with this capability since March, and we've already demonstrated a proof of concept with the digital flight authorizations, digital mission binders built anywhere and securely delivered to the crew's electronic flight bag, and mission forms completed, compiled, and delivered back to maintenance from the EFB. Currently, our 618th AOC is hard at work on another proof of concept, delivering individual flight managed crew papers out to our mobility crews. Should that capability prove viable, our next target will be normalizing this process and digital capability across the entire command, then continuing to explore and experiment with additional capabilities and integration. The command is pushing this pitch forward to compete at the Air Force level due to the incredible opportunity to scale this capability across the force. Accelerating change by leveraging the advanced capabilities already present in the digital environment to increase collaboration and integration across the force is a critical step in the right direction. So congratulations to the Digital Air Crew Initiative team on their selection as AMC's Spark Tank nominee. Team, innovation is foundational to our ability to accelerate change, and we have to approach it with what Simon Sinek calls an infinite mindset. Nobody ever wins innovation. We'll never get to a level where we have enough innovation. It's an infinite game. That's why we've changed the game this year with Spark Tank. We cannot afford to let great ideas go to waste. We've been biased towards action, and we always think about how we can do things better. But I know that I'm not the only one who can implement good ideas. I want all mobility airmen to feel empowered to go as far and as fast as you can. Mr. Lucky, thank you again for taking time to provide personal insight into how we as mobility airmen can internalize innovation and approach everything we do with an innovative mindset. Oh, I, 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 I guess I'm live. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much. It was really great to have this opportunity to chat with you guys. And man, those are some really cool projects. Uh, you know, I, I wish I was able to see some of them in person and talk with the people behind them in person. Until we all spend all of our lives in virtual reality, I guess the best that we're going to be able to figure out is Zoom, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. We do not want to do innovation theater. We want to do innovation action. And I just did not want to wait the two months to even make this decision. I told them to get after it right now and put resources against it to accelerate uh, because we can't waste any more airmen's time. And as we went around and listened to our airmen, there was some disappointment on some of the previous projects, I have to admit. So we committed that we're not waiting. We're not waiting for time. Uh, and we're going to take this one to the Air Force level because we think this can make a difference across the Air Force, not just within the Air Mobility Command. So we're very excited to them. And my sincere thanks to all the Type teams. of innovation, doing it, doing it at scale. Exactly, exactly. My sincerest thanks to all the teams who are courageous and they took the time to develop and submit packages for this year's Spark Tank. We had 49 submissions this year. 
I'm challenging the command to break 200 next year. Congratulations to our final four pitch teams and a special congrats to the Digital Air Crew Initiative team for their selection to compete at the Air Force level. Everybody, we own this. Don't wait, accelerate. Joe McNabb, over to you. <laughs> Well, wow, all I can say is most excellent. As you all know, is, which is my A++. Uh, thank you, General Venovos and Mr. Lucky. Mr. Lucky, your stories and, and your, you, you were very inspiring. I'll tell you what, uh, just, just really, really good. Uh, and what exciting times we're in and uh, such a great ending to ATA Convention Week. It uh, seems like we've been doing this. Uh, in fact, we have been doing this all week, so I guess that makes total sense. Uh, congratulations to all the Sp Spark Tank uh, competitors. What an honor to have Mr. Lucky again to present uh, during these finals and letting our young airmen see you. And it, it, that and that's just huge. Our Air Force is I'm certainly- I'm, I'm only 28. I know, I know. I don't know what it's gonna be. Like. You know, I'm a little older than that, but not not by a lot, not by, by a lot. Just fears. Yeah, there you go. Uh, our Air Force is certainly fortunate to have such superb airmen with, with such brilliant ideas. And all of you, you all truly inspire us. Today's recorded session will be available on our website. For anyone who may have missed it, please spread the word. On behalf of the Airlift Tanker Association, thank you for joining us for round 11 of our leadership series. And have a great weekend.